So I've now owned the Fuji X-H2S for about a week and a half, and I figured I'd put together a video on my thoughts on it so far. And in general, they're very positive. But there are some quirks with the camera, which have taken me some time to get used to, and uh, so I figured I'd put down what those are so far and currently what I'm doing to work around them. Uh, but I've tried filming something on this a few times in the past few days, and uh, so I'm going to cut away to about three or four days ago when it was extremely overcast and I made my first attempt at trying to go through some of the details about the camera. Well, the weather was much nicer yesterday. Uh, I did come down uh, to Forest Farm yesterday. This is a little nature reserve in the centre of Cardiff. And um, it's a lovely evening. Really beautiful sunlight and uh, there were very, very few things to photograph. It was kind of irritating. I did get some lovely video footage of a bottle drifting around in the river though. So I've now had the Fuji X-H2S for a week and um, I haven't had the lens for a week. No, I've had it for a week as of today. And uh, so far, I'm really liking it. It's, um, it's a very nice camera to use. It has its quirks. Oh, the Robins popped up behind me. Well, let's start with the cons first because there's surprisingly few. Uh, the first main irritation I have is the exposure compensation setting is very strange. Uh, it, it's not a dial on this camera like it is on most Fuji cameras. It has to be assigned to a function button, which you have to press, then turn a dial, then press it again to get back out of it. It won't allow you to change the setting correctly if you are too under or overexposed. That's really weird. I don't understand that. Um, and it can't be assigned directly to a dial, which is quite irritating because Fuji cameras or Fuji lenses largely have an aperture ring on the lens. I'd much rather use that for the aperture and then reassign one of these wheels to exposure compensation, but you can't do that in manual mode. You can only seemingly do that if you use one of the automatic modes. That's weird, I don't understand that. It's kind of annoying, but on the upside, I don't really need to use exposure compensation much on this camera because A, its metering seems to work very well and B, the dynamic range in the photos is extremely high and I'm able to recover them exceptionally well uh, afterwards. Not that it often needs it, the JPEGs are coming out very nice as well. While I'm on the subject of controls, the uh, subject detection can be enabled a disabled via a function button, which is very nice. But on the OM-1, when you set the subject detection to a button, you can push and hold that button and use a wheel to change the subject that you're detecting. You can't do that on this, and that is unfortunate. I don't often need to swap, um, but it would be nice to be able to if I suddenly saw a very exciting mammal, which is unlikely, but you never know. It's starting to get a bit busy around here, so I'll relocate for a minute. So in terms of other positives of the camera, there are many. It's, um, it's been extremely nice to use. I'm loving this lens. This, uh, this is a very beautifully designed lens. It has some really nice touches, like a default setup for doing preset AF. You press the, the rear button here and then use the front buttons to return to that AF distance. That's nice, that's um, very effective. And um, the actual performance of the lens is really nice. It's a very nice lens to use. I love that the lens foot is quickly detachable. There's a, a button here. Um, you can lock it with the knob. But it means that when you've set it on your tripod, you can quickly attach and detach the lens without having to remove the lens from the camera or the plate from the tripod. That's a really nice design feature and not one that I've seen on a huge amount of other lenses. 
the ergonomics of the camera are fantastic. I really like using it. Oh, there's a heron. Uh, it's very dark. Where's he going? He's going back. Oh, he's gone and sat in the field. That cheeky bug is probably looking for frogs. I'm going to see if I can get a little bit closer. Probably end up scaring him off, considering that I'm also carrying a tripod. They're quite flighty, the herons around here. I mean, they are quite big birds if they're in danger. It does take them a while to take off. Okay, I think he's a little bit suspicious of me. Let's we'll see if I can get a little bit closer. It won't be long until some sort of dog walker scares him off anyway, as is the way of things around here. Oh, there he goes. So far, one thing that this camera does better than the OM-1 is not get distracted by foliage that's in front of your subject. If it can see the subject, it will focus on the subject, which is a very nice change for me because I do shoot a lot in quite awkward places full of very dense foliage. He's certainly not happy about me, so I think I'm going to um, back off a bit. Back on the subject of the X-H2S, the... Um, the video and photo switching of it is very nice. You can set your custom modes to be video specific and they are then dedicated to video. It works very effectively and the video quality out of the camera is very nice and it works very well with this long lens. The image stabilization I would say is roughly equivalent to that of the OM-1 with the 300 millimeter. With the added benefit, you've got the zooming ability of this lens. It's not as good as Panasonic's image stabilization, but it's pretty good. And with some tweaking in DaVinci Resolve, which I use for editing video, I get very smooth shots from it, so I'm very happy with that. <laughs> He's been spotted by a crowd of people that were walking on the path on the other side of the bush. He's having a great time of it. I'd feel sorry for him if they weren't such evil buggers and eating literally anything else that's moving around. Oh, he's off. There we go. That was the last straw for him. And that's the problem with this nature reserve, in that it's a great nature reserve, the birds are very tame. Uh, but the only problem is that there are so many people walking through it that you have to take your chances while you can because the things are going to get spooked. Sadly, there's almost no point practicing your field craft here because <laughs> it's just random chance as to whether you're at a, it's still there by the time you get to it. Back on the positives again for the X-H2S, uh, the dynamic range of this camera is ridiculous for the type of sensor it is. Um, even though its native ISO is only 12,800 at the max, you can boost that, but you have to shoot in mechanical shutter. Kind of get the feeling that it's doing something a little bit weird with the electronic shutter behind the mechanical shutter in order to do that. But um, I've largely not really bothered. Um, I tend to shoot in electronic shutter a lot because I like being able to toggle the pre-burst mode on and off. On this camera, that's extremely straightforward. It's not really configurable, it's just on or off. Uh, so I have it configured at the moment for the little recording button that's right next to the shutter. And um, that means I can just turn it on and off when I want and um, capture birds taking off, that sort of thing. 
and uh, I think it captures the last second before you shoot. It doesn't make m as much noise. When the OM-1 was doing it, you could hear the sensor going. I think it was the image stabiliser just going... <laughs> Uh, this doesn't do that. It's, it's still silent, so that's um, that's kind of a nice change. Relocating again. So yes, as far as dynamic range goes on this camera, um, it's very weird. Uh, 12,800 is not that bright compared to some of the full-frame cameras like the S5 II that I was looking at. Um, but even if you end up underexposing by uh, well over a stop, maybe even two stops. It comes up really nice. I've had um, I'll put up a photo I took earlier this week of a uh, uh, reed bunting, I believe, and this was underexposed by well over a stop, and it came out really nice. Uh, this is processed through DxO Pure Raw, and um, then in Lightroom, and uh, I've changed nothing about this. I haven't actually adjusted the colours or anything like this. This is just the camera matching profile in Lightroom to the Velvia film simulation in the Fuji, uh, run through DxO and brought back up to the correct exposure. And it's come out very nice. It's a very detailed photo of the bird, which, um, which is very pleasing. And uh, so yeah, I'm very happy with that. And um, there are situations where I think it will still not be bright enough, but you have quite a lot of flexibility that I didn't necessarily have before um, with the ability to get a wider aperture by zooming back out um, and it generally just maintaining its colors so well even when underexposed and at 12,800 the colors are still there in the photo they're very well maintained on the subject of colors I'm liking the film simulations aspect of the Fuji camera much more than I thought I would. I wasn't previously very interested in it. I've always processed my raw photos. But I don't like processing photos. In fact, it's the reason I quit photography as a teenager is because I hated processing so many photos. It's not fun. I hate Lightroom. I hate pretty much all other photo editing software. The more that I could do in the camera, the happier I will be. Uh, so if I can get good JPEGs out of this, I'll be very happy. For non-wildlife stuff, so far I've been very pleased. I've been working on my own slightly tweaked film simulation to try and accentuate the, the correct colours of whales because it's quite damp and green here and uh, most of the default film simulations are for warmer climates, really. So it's been quite nice to sort of play around with that. I did relent and put a CF Express card in this camera. You kind of have to because it's not a dual usage slot like you get on Sony cameras. It's one CF Express B card and one SD card. Uh, for the video in it, I'm not recording Apple ProRes because I don't use a Mac. Uh, I think DaVinci Resolve will load it anyway, but I have quite a powerful computer that uh, means that I can shoot good quality 4K and edit it anyway. I don't need to shoot in raw video. It's only the raw video codecs that have to be written to the CF Express card. So if you want to save yourself some money and you're getting this camera, uh, what you can instead do is shoot all other video to the SD card, which has very few limitations in terms of speed. Uh, and there, although there are some based on the codecs that you choose, but uh, I currently have it set up so that my raw files are shot to the CF Express card. JPEGs and video are shot to the SD card, which I think makes the most amount of sense. You get the highest burst rates for the raw files, um, but you still get the benefits of easily viewing things. I don't have a CF Express reader. Uh, I have an SD card reader that plugs into my iPad, for example. I can just look at the JPEGs that way. Um, so that seems to be working quite well for me so far. If CF Express ever comes down in price, I would consider shooting raw video to it, but um, it's crazy. <laughs> I just don't want to do that to myself right now. So yeah, that's my thoughts on the Fuji X-H2S after the first week. I'm going to go for a wander and uh, see if there's much else around. Hopefully not too many people.